George, let's talk about the period of time between the end of inflation after the singularity, whatever that is, and the, the incredible inflation ending in the hot big bang and, and this enormous explosion of hot gases that was almost all uniform. And today we see these clusters of galaxies and galaxies and stars and planets. Let's talk about the intermediary. For How do you go from the this hot plasma, which there is really almost no atoms, nothing form, everything too hot, to where we have th these, these structures today. What, what is that process? Okay, so I, I, I think of it in a series of steps. And so if we start at the end of inflation, right, and we have this incredibly, you know, we have this tremendously rapidly expanding universe, it's very hot, it's very dense, there's all this material out there, but you start out with what we call the quark-gluon plasma. That is, the, the universe is broken down into these tiny particles, we think they're point-like, and it's electrons and the quarks. There are no the gluons. It's too there's hot no, to have There's atoms. no protons and neutrons yet. No, yeah, right. Okay. And so then we go through the first phase, which is when the universe expands, it keeps cooling, right? The expansion is critical. It cools down. So this rapid interaction rate slows down and slows down and it gets less dense. And there comes a time when three quarks can come together and form a proton or a neutron. They're doing that regularly, but then they're being blown back apart by the right. energy and by the fact that they're dense enough, but there comes a time when they can do that. So in the very early universe, because there's so much energy, energy can be converted into matter and antimatter and vice versa. There's all these chemical reactions, equivalent to chemical reactions going on. And you have equal, essentially equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the beginning of the universe. And that is equal amounts of quarks and antiquarks. And so most of the time the quarks are annihilating, but, it, but for some reason there's an excess of about a part in a billion of matter over antimatter, whereas early we think they were very equal, so there's a tricky thing that has to go on there. And Andrei Sakharov, a famous Russian dissident and father, of, after he was father of the Russian hydrogen bomb, set down the conditions why that might happen, and we're still studying and trying to understand that. But there's a slight excess of matter over antimatter, and as the antimatter annihilates away, there's a few residual extra matter quarks left around, they start to form the protons and the neutrons. And they form equal numbers of protons and neutrons. About how far into, into the universe uh, 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 what time uh, scale are we now? We're, we're talking you know, 10 to the minus 12 seconds into, well, in the, in the range of 10 to the minus 12 seconds down to a thousandth of a second. We're okay, talking so we're still in that within sort of range. the first second. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, all, all the action happens early, so you have to think of it on a, right, right. You know, on a sliding scale, right? right? And, and so it's powers of 10. Right, logarithmic. Right. right, because it's the beautiful thing about physics is that things happen on different levels. So the simplest stuff is up here at the highest energy level, and you form a building block, and from that you form more building blocks, right? So we start with, with space-time itself, and then we make quarks, and then the quarks make the protons and neutrons. The next step that we're getting ready to go to is the protons and neutrons bind together to make the nuclei. Right. That is, they, 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 they make the, the unbound proton as the hydrogen, and then you can bind two protons and two neutrons together and get helium and so on up to carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and everything else. And so what we're doing in the early universe is we're letting the protons and neutrons get together, but the hot radiation keeps blowing the protons and neutrons apart as soon as deuterium forms. Right. But eventually it cools down enough that the light elements can form, and we get sort of a lot of the neutrons decayed, leaving us with excess of protons. So 75% is just plain hydrogen, and 25% is helium, and there's a smattering of other stuff. There wasn't time. And then we're stuck. We have this primordial soup of, of hydrogen and helium, and it's in a hot plasma, and we have to wait the 400,000 years until atoms can form. It's just nuclei and free electrons. And when are those nuclei forming, just to give us a the, time period? The, the, Steven Weinberg has this beautiful book called The First Three Minutes, <laughs> right? And it, it's not about sex, it's about <laughs> making the material in the universe. It's right. quite beautiful. Right. And it's in the first three or four minutes is where most of this is happening. And, and then we have to wait this the, longer period of time. Then we have to wait 400,000 years till we can make atoms. That is, combine the, the universe expands and cools enough so we can actually have neutral atoms form. That is, electrons can bind with the nuclei to form the kind of atoms we're used to in this room. Right. And once that happens, we have another time period to wait until that, those atoms can gather together to make the first generation of stars. Through gravity. Through gravity, right? So this original perturbations we saw allow gravitational attraction to, to pull material in and to build it up, very much the way the Earth must have been made, but before that, because we didn't have the materials to make the Earth. Yet we have to make we have to cook the first set of elements in stars, right? and then the stars 
send out the first cooked up elements. By blowing up in supernova. Right. By blowing up supernova is the primary way, but they also stellar winds. You, you uh -huh. can get a fair amount out uh -huh. of stellar winds. Uh -huh. But supernova are the primary way. And so you need this first generation of very massive stars that burn furiously and build up these stellar elements, build up a hydrogen, carbon, the nitrogen, the oxygen, all the way up to iron. Because of the pressure the, inside of them, right. they can combine the lighter right. elements into heavier right. elements. Right, you need very high densities and high temperatures. And you had high temperatures in the middle of the universe, but you didn't have the high densities. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So you couldn't get up to the carbon. You, and in fact, Hoyle pointed out there had to be a triple resonance in carbon for this to work. Yeah. And people went out and measured it. And it was, you know, Willie Fowler, you know, one of the reasons he got the Nobel Prize was finding this was there. And, and it all fits together beautifully. And you can understand how the matter got generated. First, it came from the Big Bang. Then it was produced in stars. And then the stars ejected the material. And then, it's like ecology in a forest. Now new stars and planets can form, right? So we're second generation already, at least. Uh -huh. Actually, some hint that we're partly third generation. That we're a mixture of at least two different stars in the solar system. And it's really quite a, a lovely story. It's like you think of the, I think of the galaxy as like the jungle in Brazil, <laughs> right? There's this processing of, of, the, of the nutrients up into the stars and then back uh -huh. out into the medium and back up in the stars, right? And that's the spiral arms are, are the, where the new stars are forming. Right. And we just happen to be in one, and we're, and we're lucky. Spiral arms of the, each the galaxy. The spiral arm of our galaxy is the leading edge, is right. where a lot of stars are forming. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's really kind of an interesting organic kind of process on a big scale. In, in this whole uh, remarkable story, how much is backed by real observational data as opposed to strong theory, which is very consistent. And how many different ways can we uh, assess that data? Is it one right. or is it diverse ways? I mean, starting right at the beginning. Right. So we, can, we, we don't know yet the answer about why there's excess of matter over antimatter. That's an unsolved problem that we're working on. I did a series of experiments to see if there was any matter in the universe. Other people have done them since then. But uh, there's, it was clear to me when I stopped and started working on the health of background, that there wasn't a significant amount of antimatter in the universe, that somehow there was this excess. But th there's other evidence, there's plenty of evidence. You don't see annihilations between, when, when galaxies collide, right. you don't see annihilation. You, and matter and antimatter would annihilate. And, and so there's lots of evidence that tell you that there's not a lot of antimatter in the universe. Right. And, but there's a lot of evidence that also tell you there was equal amounts in the beginning, or almost equal amounts, right? Evidence or theory? Evidence. Okay. Is we, we, we see the, the degrees of freedom, when things are energetic enough, every degree of freedom will be populated equally. You see that in every interaction that we do. And we see how many cosmic microwave background photons are left. There's about a billion of them for every proton or neutron there is, right? And so back when they were as energetic as protons and neutrons, they could easily convert into them. Right? Oh, so right, right, we right. know that there were roughly equal amounts back then. This, we, we can count them, right? It's just count, there's 413 photons in every cubic centimeter. You can, and there's, right, only and, on the Earth are there that many. And, and just, and then project that back. We know how many right. photons there are today, a billion for every, right. every proton right. in today's right. universe. We count that. We that, can just count it, right. And then you project back. And you can then, at the energy levels that the photons would be, you can estimate what the matter and antimatter would have been. Right, and so they have to be equal to a better than a part in a billion, right? Better, better than a part in 10 billion. And, and you can understand very likely, because there are inter things that could violate the, the, the number and convert matter and antimatter, that they would be equal amounts at the beginning, mm. right? And so it's, it's very likely that there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and then the slight imbalance and the difference between matter and antimatter caused this asymmetry up here and caused us to be here. Mm. So we're double, there are double factors. We had to have the fluctuations in order to form the galaxies. We also had to have this excess of matter over antimatter, uh, this small variation <laughs> that, that make it possible to be in this room, right? Mm. And uh, so there are a lot of nice things that fit together very well. And but we can also then do the calculations of how the, the nuclei formed and the elements formed and see by looking at stars that are they're still first generation stars, what they were made out of, and we can see it matches. We can then use the cosmic microwave background to see when the first atoms were forming, what fluctuations were going on, you know, what variations the matter had acoustic waves in it. You know, the speed of sound depends a little bit at that point on how much is matter and how much is dark matter and so forth. You can actually see that about 4% of the universe was made of matter at that epoch, which is 400,000 years. Back at three minutes, 
it was also 4% because mm. of the ratio of, of photons uh, to, to, to protons and neutrons. And you can also look at what the universe looks like today. And so all three epochs give you the same picture that 4% of the energy content of the universe is ordinary matter kind of stuff. So this beautiful picture that you paint, painted by cosmologists, is backed by independent sources of data, each one of which confirm the story. Right. There are several different observations from several different epochs, several different techniques that all give you the same answer, that the stuff we're made out of and the stuff we see around us is only a small percentage of what's in the universe, but it's a vital percentage.